on Prime Crime. Sheriff, number one, what's your emergency? Well, we think we found a dead body. A young single mom with a bright future ahead. She was trying to make a life for her son. She was attending college to be a dental assistant. Samira met Zachary, a military member. She fell head over heels for. But when she turns up missing, it triggers a real life NCIS investigation. Y'all yeah, feel like I had the mold to do something to her, but I really, I didn't do nothing to that girl. I don't, I don't even know where she at. Did you ever hear William say anything during this time about being upset with Samira or wanting to do her any kind of harm? Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime, where we break down the most compelling and memorable true crime cases from across the country. When 25-year-old Samira Watkins vanishes near a Florida naval base, police have some suspects. But tying one of them to the crime is tougher than anyone expected. 911, where is your emergency? Um, it's like a non-emergency. We want to like report a missing person. Who is she? It's my sister. And what is her name? Samira Watkins. Where was the last place you saw her? The last place I seen her was um, Thursday night around 8 o'clock. One of our officers responded to a call of a missing person. Uh, that officer realized that the circumstances of the incident seemed quite a bit fishy and contacted me with the need for an investigation to start immediately. Saturday, October 31st, 2009, Pensacola, Florida. Police detective Jonathan Thacker interviews 911 caller Sylvia Watkins, whose older sister Samira has gone missing. Tell me from the very beginning, uh, everything that has happened that has made, made you concerned about your sister's well-being. Um, Thursday night, she, um, when she got off of work, she came home, and she was getting dressed to go, go to his house. On the night of October 29th, Samira had completed her shift at a local McDonald's restaurant where she was the manager. After that, she came home, changed her clothes, and indicated that she was heading out to meet her boyfriend, Zachary Littleton. Littleton was a 24-year-old member of the United States Navy. He was stationed at the Pensacola Naval Air Station. She was very excited about this guy she met who was in the military. She was looking forward to a future with him. She asked me to drop her off, but I was too tired. I was already in bed asleep. And um, after that, I guess she, that's when she left. So it's around 9 o'clock in the, in, the, in the evening. All right, so she drove herself over, and we don't really know where she went, but we, we know that she was saying she was going to go to his house. Mm -hmm. Is that the last time that you've heard her? Heard from you. Samira Watkins was a 25-year-old single mom. She was the oldest of five children in her family. She had a child of her own, a little boy of four years old. Uh, she was a manager at a local fast food restaurant, and she uh, was uh, going to college to be a, a dental assistant. Did she ever say anything to you that would make you think that she would just need to get away? Is this out of her character? No. She had never made any comments like, I just gotta get away from things or... No. Okay. When she didn't arrive home, her family and friends were very concerned. When did you start calling her? I started calling her that morning. That next morning. I had Friday morning? All throughout the day, I've been calling her like... And initially, he would ring and get to go to voicemail. Yeah. And I understand that now, it doesn't even ring, it just goes to voicemail. Mm -hmm. When she stopped responding to the family when they couldn't reach her the next day, her sister went to look for her at Zachary's home. And that's when she got a real surprise. About 12, we went out there, me and my cousin went out there. And that's when we knocked on his door, we didn't get no answer. So we knocked on the neighbor's door. And that's when she told us that he was loading a couch on the, um, on the truck and said that he was moving because he needed a bigger place for his wife and kids. It was shocking because Zachary Littleton was leading a double life. He was married, he had a child. They told Samira his name was Ricky. He was not who he said he was. 
And what we learned is that his wife it was also in the Navy and was scheduled to actually move to Pensacola from South Carolina where she was stationed in the next week. But there's another twist to Samira's story. She found out she was pregnant probably like a month ago. And um, she told him, and he was saying that he didn't want any more kids. He's married. He's not supposed to go outside his relationship. And what is his reaction? He wanted her to get a abortion. Tell me about things that she told you about him. Okay. First, everything was cool or whatever. She liked him or whatnot. Then, when she found out she was pregnant, he was saying, like, get an abortion or punch in your stomach and I ain't got nothing to do with you. It was kind of scary to me. Fearing the worst, Pensacola police contact Florida State Prosecutor Bridget Myers Jensen. I became involved early on in the case because there was such an unusual and suspicious circumstance. Zachary Littleton was initially a suspect and probably the strongest suspect because he found out that Samira was pregnant and he was not happy about the pregnancy. He was also the last person that we knew Samira had been with the night that she went missing. So Detective Thacker gives Littleton a call. Hey, how you doing? Hey, this is Ricky. It's, uh, Zachary Littleton. Oh, okay, yeah, what's going on? He very quickly indicated that he wasn't Ricky, he was Zach. And that was odd. There'd be a different name given uh, by the family as to what this actual person's telling me. Hey, uh, you know this young lady, Samira? Samira, Samira, yeah, she said Sammy. That's what, that's what she told me, kind of Sammy. He, in fact, didn't even recognize her name at first when he was asked. They said, do you know a Samira? And his response is Samira, Samira, um, uh, Sammy. She called herself Sammy, as if this was a person he had just met. Do you know where she is now? No, I don't. Okay. All right, look, here's the deal. Um, she she has been reported missing, okay? And at this point, we're, we're investigating her whereabouts. So I need to talk to you and not over the phone. It was obviously important to see what he knew. He was essentially, could have been the last person to see Samira alive. So I asked him to come down for an interview. Okay, all right. You'll have a seat here. You work for the Navy, right? Right. Uh, NAS Police Department. Okay, so you're like a, are you like a, like a, a military police? Okay. Hearing that Zachary Littleton was a military police officer, part of me thought, well, certainly a police officer in the military wouldn't hurt somebody or, or cause them to go missing. I want to hear his explanation for why she's missing and what all he knew. So you've known her for how long then? Family? Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. A few months, not a whole year. When is, when is the last time that you saw Sammy? The last time I've seen her was Wednesday when I dropped off at home. Have you seen her any time since when you dropped her off? No, I haven't. He indicated that he had never seen Samira on the night of her disappearance on the 29th. And that was odd because she was supposedly going to his house. Did you have any kind of a relationship with Sammy that was more than just friends? No. So he's clearly not faithful to his wife, but he had to keep that a secret because under military rules, you can get disciplined if you commit adultery. I, I want you to know that um, I, I'm not the military. I want you to feel free to tell me everything without you worrying about getting in trouble. Okay, we had sex once or twice. You know, there wasn't nothing really a relationship. We were just friends of what I thought it was. So. Maybe I did some things, I said some things that probably made her believe that we were in a relationship, but I didn't see it that way. When Samira met Zachary, she saw a military member who was very handsome and seemed to have his head on his shoulders and was charming and someone that she fell head over heels for and wanted to build a future with. Sometimes just catch her staring at me and just, you know, looking at me like she just admired by me so much. That's why I was like, no, nah, man, we can't. He knew from the beginning that you weren't going to be the one in my life. 
when investigators asked him about his feelings, Dak reacted cavalier towards a relationship with Samira. Yeah, this was just a fling. Was she depressed back then or anything? I mean, you know, she, she was kind of like, having a sad tone to her. She was like, we need to tell her. Was the conversation centered around her thinking that she was pregnant with your child? No, it was more centered around why we can't spend time together. Was she pregnant? I don't know. So she never came to you and said, hey, this is your baby? And she never actually came out and said that? No. Do like the baby was going to be born. Well, I mean, if she really was pregnant, weren't you at all concerned? Would it be mine? Right. No. He didn't want any part of this child. He didn't want any serious relationship with Samira. After all, he was married, living a double life. He already had a child. And so he tried to encourage Samira to get an abortion. And that was something that Samira did not want to do. She wanted to have the baby. When I asked Littleton about his alibi, for lack of better words, on the night of the 29th, he basically said he was at home all night, that he was moving. There is our work, and that night I was boxing up and cleaning up stuff. Well, I ain't really clean, I was just boxing up my belongings and stuff. But my wife and my daughter, she'll, they'll be here in, in Friday, the 6th. He was living in an apartment at that time here in Pensacola, and with his wife and his child being stationed within a week here in Pensacola, it just, they had made a decision to leave the apartment and move into a home. They'll be here and um, we need a bigger, the apartment just one big enough for uh, a family so we can uh, bring in a house here. Uh, so he said that that night he was packing all night into the wee hours of the morning, getting all this stuff put in boxes and, and things like that so that he could begin to move the next day. Where, where do you think she is? I don't know. I mean, I didn't do it. She I was, I was anything. I'm not responsible for her being missed. That's why we get her. You want to know if I'm responsible for her being missed. Zachary Littleton seemed a little flippant and not concerned whatsoever as to where Samira may be. Clearly, Littleton doesn't want the affair to come out, but that on its face doesn't mean he's involved in Samira's disappearance especially since there's another development. Once Littleton had moved out of his apartment and we were able to go and search the apartment to see what was left behind, if there was a crime scene somewhere in, in the apartment, we didn't find anything of obvious concern. We didn't find blood. We didn't find where an obvious struggle had occurred. We didn't feel like it would be prudent to focus solely on him. We began to research uh, Samira's past, and what we learned is that Samira had a, uh, a boyfriend uh, who had just gotten out of prison, actually, a guy by the name of William Peters. William Peters was the father of Samira's four-year-old child. They had had a very tumultuous relationship, both physically and mentally. Uh, Mr. Peters was abusive to Samira. At the time that Samira went missing, she did have a restraining order against her child's father, William Peters. So he was someone who was dealing with obviously anger management issues, who had some feelings for Samira that were so intense that he committed crimes. And so now Samira goes missing. That's a big break for law enforcement. Could the father of Samira's four-year-old son have had something to do with her disappearance? Up next, Detective Thacker pays a visit to William Peters' family. Did you ever hear William say anything um, during this time about being upset with Samira or wanting to do her any kind of harm? You're aware that she was um, last seen on October the 29th, 2009. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. On that date, do you remember much about that evening? Well, I know I hadn't seen her that day, and uh, I had been here all day. She supposed to have came by to drop on off, but never did show up. Days after Samira Watkins was last seen alive, Pensacola Police Sergeant Jonathan Thacker interviews Linda Nobles. Linda is the mother of Samira's ex, William Peters, and the grandma of Peters and Samira's young son. William Peters had done time for actually battering Samira Watkins. When William got out of jail, it was a short time before Samira went missing. So that was another thing that was a red flag for us that perhaps William Peters was responsible for Samira going missing. 
I did go to his house. I interviewed his family. All right, so she was supposed to come by to drop off her child for you to watch him? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever find out why it is that she didn't? I never heard from her. He had a violent past, and he was free, and they wanted to establish whether he had a real alibi. Let's talk about William for a minute, okay? Um, William has a job, yes, yes or no? Yes, he does have a job. job. What is his job? He worked with my daughter. Okay, what kind of work do they do? They do genitalia cleaning. Okay. Um, so they, they clean office buildings? Yes, they do. Right after getting out of jail, he began to work cleaning in the middle of the night. So him and his crew would go to companies, uh, businesses, uh, and, and do cleaning for them. So by 11 p.m. on the 29th, he was getting home? Yes. Okay. Once he got home, what did he do? Okay, he came home, spoke to me, uh, asked me did I plug up the uh, fryer so he can cook him something to eat. He went straight in the back and started cooking him something to eat. And after that, he started watching TV. On this on this evening of the 29th, and also we're talking about the 30th in the right. morning, mm -hmm. did William ever leave the home? No, he did not. And on the night of the uh, of October 29th, I was able to verify that William Peters was actually on a crew that night cleaning, um, and I had his alibi pretty well secured at that point. And therefore, he was ruled out as a suspect. And there was something else that convinced investigators that William Peters wasn't their man. When William Peters was notified that Samira was missing, he was very upset and obviously concerned for her safety as well as her whereabouts. He was upset for his child, the, the child they had in common, knowing that, you know, if she's not found, then, you know, his son could be without a mother. Um, you know, so he had, he was showing genuine concern uh, for Samira's well-being. In stark contrast to Zachary Littleton, who really didn't show much concern at all. Detective Thacker turns his attention back to Zachary Littleton, the man who was secretly having an affair with Samira and caused her to be pregnant. Thacker brings Littleton in for another interview. Did your wife know that you were talking to this girl? No. Okay. Would that be a problem if she knew that? No, because she knew, she knew I have a lot of friends, and uh, she didn't know about, she don't know about Sam, she don't know their name, I put it like that, she knew I talked to other girls. During the course of the interview with Littleton, we talked to him about his cell phones, and he indicated that he had at least two cell phones. And he wasn't really shy as the interview progressed, he wasn't shy to indicate to us that one of those phones was kind of for the girls to call him on. Zachary was known on the base as a player, a playboy, someone who had multiple relationships. In fact, later on when he was talking to police, he said that Samir was just one of many extramarital relationships he had. What I learned was that the phone was a, uh, we call a burner phone. Zachary Littleton was using the burner phone to call Samira. It was uh, the kind of phone that you get at um, maybe a convenience store. It, it, you, take it home, you register it online or over the phone, and you don't have to give a lot of information to the companies that, that service those phones. I had two cell phones. I had a um, Boost mobile phone. And uh, she was, that number she used to call me on, like, I cut that phone off. So the Boost one, she used to call you on that? Mm -hmm. and, you, and why'd you shut it off again? Because I was getting text messages that didn't want to have nobody call me and harass me by anything. So. I cut it off. And hearing that just kind of started to build an understanding of the kind of person that that Littleton was. Zachary had a cavalier attitude towards the relationship and the child. In reality, it was always about him. As Littleton talks about Samira, something strikes the detective as odd. I'm trying to recreate this young lady in my mind. I don't know her. All right. And if I can recreate her and kind of get in her head, I might be able to find out where she's at, um, what her demeanor was like. Um, she was a real calm girl. She wasn't no feisty type, I know. Yeah, she was real just calm, you know. I ain't gonna say she was, she was nice. You know, she, was that, she had good tendency to be a good woman. I put it like that. He used her name in the past tense a lot. 
when he would refer to her, which at that time it was a uh, missing person. Missing persons often are found alive and perfectly fine. In fact, they usually are. And he was already referring to her in the past tense. What do you think happened with her? And where is she at now? I don't know. They said she was on the way to my house. Okay, what do you think, though? I hope she's okay. I, mean, I, I understand that, but I mean, what do you I think? Mean, she, what do you I think? Y'all feel like I had the mode to do something to her, but I really, I didn't do nothing to that girl. I don't, I don't know where she at. She didn't come to my house Thursday, so. Zachary Littleton was stonewalling investigators. She was pregnant, and he was trying to protect his family and his career. Under military rules, adultery is an offense. You get sanctioned for that. Plus, he's married with a child and so you can see why a child with his mistress could complicate things at home and at work. Detective Thacker has hit a dead end with Zachary Littleton. But the very next day, four days after Samira disappeared, there's a major turn of events. Sure, it's 911. What's your emergency? What's the Navy Point? Okay, what's the Navy Point? Uh, we think we found a dead body. It's in, it's in a bag, a big old, like, like a big old, like, bag you carry on a train. It looks like it has blood over it, has a big old lock up on it. It's off the beach. It's real heavy. On Tuesday, November 3rd, I was notified that a duffel bag had been located, washed ashore in a local body of water right ac across from uh, the Pensacola Naval Air Station. The people that found it, which were jet skiers, were concerned enough to call law enforcement. When they discovered the black duffel bag, there was a very foul odor coming from it, and it obviously appeared to be uh, suspicious. So inside of this bag, in the fetal position, was the body of a black female. It would end up being Samira Watkins. Um, she had duct tape wrapped from her chin up to just uh, below her eyeballs, all the way around her head. Um, she was clothed only in a, a bra. She was otherwise nude. Um, inside of the bag, there was uh, a Clorox wipe that was kind of balled up in, in the bottom of the bag. And there was also a paper towel. A fingerprint analysis is performed on site and confirms the body is Samira's. And this would be the break that law enforcement needed in this case. Upon finding the body in the duffel bag, this case transformed from a missing persons case to a homicide. The medical examiner ruled that Samira had been asphyxiated and that, uh, it was, that she was suffocated. Um, my theory was that she was likely strangled by whoever killed her. The autopsy also reveals what could be an important clue. When the autopsy was done on Samira, the medical examiner removed the duct tape from around her face and around her head, around her ears, and it was noticed at that point that she was only wearing one of her gold hoop earrings. And the reason this was so significant is because these earrings were so sentimental to her, and according to her family members, she wore them all the time. Surveillance footage from the fast food restaurant where Samira was working the night she was last seen showed her wearing both earrings and she only had one. The other one had fallen off at some point. And I surmised that she probably lost that earring during some kind of an altercation, and it probably dropped at or near the place where uh, she was assaulted and then later killed. So whoever had the other hoop earrings was going to be the main suspect in her death. Investigators strongly suspect that person was Zachary Littleton. However, they still have no direct evidence connecting him to the crime. So they call in the big guns, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, the NCIS. So being that our suspect was a member of the United States Navy, uh, Zachary Littleton, um, and we knew that a lot of our witnesses and the friends that Zachary had were also members of the Navy, um, we reached out to NCIS uh, to help us out. They'd be able to help facilitate interviews, perhaps records of things that, that went on. So I worked closely with NCIS uh, during the investigation. Coming up, 
Detective Thacker interviews Zachary Littleton's friends. Will they lead to a breakthrough? What do you think? Based on what, what you've heard and what we've disclosed oh, to you, what do you think is the most reasonable? Baby mama drama, I mean, you know, he got her pregnant and I know he's married with another child and I know she's coming down soon. Hey everybody, we're going to get you right back to the Samira Watkins case in a minute, but before we do, I want to call out one of the sponsors of this episode of Prime Crime, Truthfinder. So in a world where we have to ask, how well do we really know the people in our lives, Truthfinder is a service that can maybe provide you some answers because it's one of the largest public records search services in the United States. You go on the website, truthfinder.com, you type in a name, and within minutes and a paid subscription purchase, you can access unlimited reports that can include information like phone numbers, location history, criminal and traffic records, including possible arrests, criminal convictions. Also, if you type in an address within a report, it can show you registered sex offenders in an area, which is honestly just kind of wild to see. So whether it's researching new dates or friends or reconnecting with people, Truthfinder is a great tool. And right now you can get 50% off of confidential background reports. Just go to truthfinder.com slash LC Prime Crime. You're a policeman? Yes. Okay. Yes. With those circumstances, what does that lead you to believe that? All eyes are pointing out, everything's pointing to him. Early November 2009, just days after Samira Watkins' murder, investigators try a new tack to find out who killed her and dumped her body near the Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida. Could it be Navy police officer Zachary Littleton, the man who was having a secret affair with Samira? Police interview Littleton's friends and colleagues. Did you work on Thursday? Yes, I did. Past Thursday? Yes, I did. When did you next hear Littleton? Oh, in the parking lot. When? That, that evening, after we downloaded it, because we were making plans for me to go over the next morning and help him move from his apartment to his new house. All right, so it's in the parking lot that he approached you about helping him move? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and what time was that? About 10, 10, 15-ish, maybe. I mean, at the, at the latest. Zachary Littleton was uh, at work at the base earlier in the evening that he left his job. He uh, drove directly up to his house, and he's arriving at his house just before uh, Samira would also arrive at his house. Littleton followed up with his friend the next day, the morning after Samira was last seen. That morning, he texted me about seven something in the morning, and I was still sleeping. And I woke up at about 8.30ish, and he said, can you be here by nine? But I couldn't get there until 9.15. All right, so you guys arrive at his house at what start? So what happened at his house? Uh, we were standing there. We basically made up like a, like a game plan on how we want to start moving everything. And uh, he backed the truck up, and then we started taking the furniture down. But surely he has other things, you know, knick-knack things. Clothing? Yes. So I asked him, I was like, why isn't your clothes packed? And he said, I don't have any luggage. And he pulled all his drawers out, and he just set them on the side. And we didn't move those out. They were, when I left, they were still in his bedroom. While Zach was supposed to be ready, he wasn't. So that kind of messed up his alibi even further that he was indicating to us that he was at home packing all night when in reality, nothing was done. If that seems suspicious, what Littleton did earlier that same morning really raised detectives' eyebrows. We, we did have a friend come forward that said that on the morning of October 30th, so we're talking about the morning after Samira's disappearance, Zach comes to her house at 5 a.m., so very early, and he's uh, asking if he can do his laundry over at her house. Is it usual for him to want to come to your house at 4 and 5 in the morning? Does that strike you as a little odd? Yeah, but he said he'd just been packing all night. Did make us feel like he was probably doing that to destroy some sort of evidence or to wash away blood or something along those lines. Littleton's supervisor raises more suspicions about the night Samira went missing. Is there anything that you can think of that you know, me being his mentor, I asked him, you know, is he okay? And he said one thing. He said that, yeah, she came over and asked to stay over. And I told her, uh, I don't want her to come over here. So I took her home. And I said, took her home? Like, if he took her home, what happened to the car, stuff like that? What night was he saying that was? Thursday. That statement directly contradicts what Littleton's been saying, that he last saw Samira on Wednesday. Now, 
investigators start to put the pieces together. The theory that I have is that Samira made it to Zachary's apartment and whoever killed her or uh, put her in the bag um, likely used her own car to transport her body to that waterway. And it seems Detective Thacker was right on the money. It was several days later that we had a neighbor contact the police to say that they had located a red Ford Taurus. Now that Taurus was parked in a, a driveway and it had been there for several days. So when we got there, we found that, that it was indeed Samira's car. My theory was that after dumping her body, Zachary Littleton also dumped the car and left it there in that driveway. Law enforcement found Zachary Littleton's DNA on the steering wheel of Samira Watkins' car. He had mentioned in one of his interviews that he had never been in her car, much less driven it, so that was obviously very important. On November 6, we conducted a search warrant at Zachary Littleton's home. Now, keep in mind, we believed that when the murder occurred, he was living at the apartment. We had looked in the apartment, found that there was nothing there of value, but we also knew that a lot of the evidence he could have very easily moved with him, either knowingly or inadvertently. When law enforcement was going through the different areas of his house, inside of one of the bedrooms were some paper towels that had a pattern that were consistent with the paper towels that were found inside the duffel bag. And there was also a can of Clorox wipes that were consistent with a wipe that was found in the duffel bag. The number one most valuable item that we found, the thing that was the best piece of evidence was the earring, uh, an earring that matched exactly the earring that Samira Watkins had. There were a lot of pieces of evidence that were important to the case, but certainly the gold earring was a uh, smoking gun. Now, investigators have the best idea so far of what happened to Samira Watkins. Our theory of the case was that Samira went to go see Zachary Littleton the night of October 29th, 2009. At some point while she was at his apartment, a neighbor saw and heard Zachary and Samira arguing. We believe that same night, Samira was suffocated or smothered or somehow asphyxiated inside of Zachary Littleton's apartment. He then wrapped duct tape around her face. He placed her naked body in a duffel bag. He took the duffel bag from his apartment and put it in the trunk of her car. He then drove to the other side of town and threw her body into the bayou. In order to confirm their theory, local authorities need cold, hard evidence. So they reach out to the NCIS. One of the things that NCIS helped us out with is that there was new technology at the time for cell phone mapping, specifically cell phone tower mapping. I knew I'd be able to get the tower hits from the phone provider, but the mapping uh, would have been made a lot easier if NCIS was involved. So when I pulled Samira's phone records uh, in the months leading up to her death, I did see where she was talking to Littleton pretty regularly, but then there came a point where that stopped, but then a mystery number came about. I think that when he decided he was gonna kill Samira, is when he decided to cut ties with her from his regular phone and start using the burner phone without supposedly us finding out. And on the day of her disappearance, that number called her a total of 11 times. It was the main number calling her, quite frankly. NCIS was able to determine where their cell phones were pinging onto the nearby cell phone towers. And with that information, they were able to track the two of them who were traveling together and also put holes in Zachary Littleton's story about moving and not seeing Samira. We can see plain as day where Samira was at work at her fast food job, that she left, that she came down to where she lives, which is a, pretty much across town. She's there for a little while, and the next thing you know, you see her heading back up to uh, the area where Zachary Littleton lived. And it actually showed she made it to his house despite him saying earlier in our interviews that she never arrived. And instead of him being at home all night and packing like he told us, we see him actually leaving his house by way of the tower hits and headed back toward the base. The cell phone data seems to show that Littleton was heading for the spot where Samira's body was found. But one question remains. 
how did Littleton get home when Samira's car was found 10 miles away? The location where we found Samira's car was clear across town, roughly 10 miles away. It didn't seem feasible that Zachary Littleton was able to just walk home. So we played around with the idea, did he have somebody that helped him? Did he have a friend come pick him up? Back then, Ubers weren't a big thing, and there's only one way you can do it, and that is taxi cab. And so law enforcement called all the taxi cab companies, and bingo, they found the cab that Zachary Littleton was traveling in on his way back from killing Samira. Zach had ordered a cab from a Waffle House that was about a mile from where Samira's car was left. They went to that location and got video surveillance and were able to find Zachary Littleton inside the Waffle House at approximately 4.20 a.m. with a can of Clorox wipes. He walks into the restaurant and actually asks to borrow their phone. Um, they allowed him to do it and he talks on the phone for a very short amount of time and hands the phone back to the employee and he goes outside where at some point within a short period of time a cab comes and drives him away. There is a point on the video surveillance where Zachary Littleton looks directly into one of the cameras that was inside of the Waffle House. This guy is not as smart as he thought he was. He was caught on camera, not only on camera, but looking directly into the camera at the Waffle House where he was calling for the taxi. Not only calling for the taxi, but doing so while holding a tub of Clorox wipes, something that's used to clean up blood and other incriminating evidence. Littleton's goose was cooked once he was caught on camera, once the taxi cab records came through, and once the body was found. So even before the video at, at the restaurant, I, I mean, I knew Zachary Littleton was likely going to be our suspect, but that was, that was like putting some level of icing on the cake. I, I felt very confident then that I, we would be able to make the arrest. On November 23rd, less than a month after Samira's murder, police arrest Zachary Littleton. Zachary Littleton was indicted for first degree premeditated murder, and that was the charge that I went to trial on. When we return, despite all the evidence, getting a conviction is not going to be as easy as you might think. My biggest concern going to trial on this particular case was because it was 100% circumstantial. I really didn't have an eyewitness. I didn't have forensics that directly linked Zachary Littleton to the homicide. I didn't have video surveillance of the homicide itself. So my concern was that it was just so circumstantial. Hey everybody, we're gonna get you right back to the Samira Watkins episode in just a minute, but before we do, I wanna call out one of our great sponsors of Prime Crime, Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Look, if you should find yourself in that position where you're hurt and you need legal representation, Morgan & Morgan may be who you want in your corner because they're specialists in this area. And you know why they're so big? Because they win a lot, verdicts and settlements in the multi-millions across this country. Yeah, and they don't settle for lowball offers. They also make the process so easy for their clients because from starting your claim to uploading documents, to signing contracts, to talking to your legal team. It can all be done from your smartphone. Also, there's no upfront fee. You only pay them if you win. So if you're injured, you can easily start a claim at forthepeople.com slash prime crime. When I have a case like this, I look at all the possibilities. Right. Okay. If you're responsible not to, it's possible that you kill her. All right. June 27th, 2011, Escambia County, Florida. Almost two years after Samira Watkins' murder, Zachary Littleton's trial begins. My strategy going into the trial was to create a timeline that went from the beginning of summer when Zachary and Samira first met into November when her body was discovered and the earring was found in his house. And then in between that timeline, trying to plug in pieces of evidence that would create a clear picture of Zachary Littleton's guilt. The defense relies on the lack of direct physical evidence. A challenge for prosecutors was that there wasn't clear blood or DNA evidence linking Littleton to the murder. And prosecutors had to still put the pieces of the puzzle together. And Littleton chooses not to take the stand. So although the jury doesn't hear him testify on the stand, they saw him in the police interviews 
being a sociopathic liar. Was she saying that it was your baby? She had no idea it was my baby. All those lies show consciousness of guilt, show what kind of person he is, and it made it clear to the jury this was someone who you could not trust. Zachary Littleton's demeanor during the course of his trial was confident and almost borderline arrogant. He seemed to be more concerned about what he was wearing and how he looked as opposed to the evidence that the state was presenting against him. Prosecutors had a really good case. They had the gold hoop earring. That's as close to a smoking gun as you can get in this case. That's direct evidence that he was the one who committed this heinous crime. How did the other gold hoop earring get into Zachary Littleton's apartment unless he was the one who killed her? And then, of course, the cell tower records that show the location of Zachary Littleton and Samira the night she went missing because it put them in the exact same area. And prosecutors have another weapon in their arsenal. Some of the most important pieces of evidence to show the jurors were some searches on Zachary Littleton's computer. These searches included um, how long does it take for a body to decompose, he was looking at searches related to putting a body in a landfill, how to cause a person to have an abortion, uh, does drinking vinegar cause an abortion. He was Googling abortion locations within our city. Those searches then turned into how to speed up human decomposition, and then they led into how to pass a polygraph. So his searches were obviously key in the time frame of you know, beginning when she was pregnant to then wanting to cause a miscarriage to then when he was being interrogated by law enforcement. That is so bad for the jury. There is no way to explain it other than you just killed your girlfriend and you're trying to ensure that you don't get caught. They had this guy dead to rights. You don't have to have too much direct evidence when you have this mountain of circumstantial evidence. Three days later on June 30th, the jury begins deliberations and they reach a verdict quickly. It only took the jury three hours to reach a verdict in this case. Once the evidence was presented and the timeline was proven and the alibi was discounted that he tried to provide, I think it was very clear to the jurors beyond a reasonable doubt that he was in fact the person that murdered Samir Watkins. The jury finds Zachary Littleton guilty of first degree premeditated murder. Jurors clearly had a visceral reaction to Zachary Littleton. Zachary seemed to use his position, his power, for nefarious means by getting, gaining the confidence of Samira to make her believe that he was someone who he was not. But it's also someone who the jury would hate, a liar, a cheat, and a killer. Zachary Littleton was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I believe that justice was served for Samira Watkins for her unborn child, for her four-year-old little boy, and for the rest of her family members that loved her so much. He'll be in prison for a very long time. He was 24 years old when this happened, and he, um, he's he got a lot of life left where he'll have to do it behind bars. How would you categorize her mental state? Did she change when she when the revelation occurred that she was pregnant? I think she was okay mentally. She used to send me like some crazy text messages, like why I didn't speak to her in a couple of days. And I had to call her, man, what's, your, what's wrong with you? So I believe that Zach uh, Littleton made the decision to murder Samira because he was, he was desperate. He had a couple different things working against him. One of them, being in the military, it's against their code of conduct to commit adultery. Uh, he would have likely lost rank if they had found out that he had uh, been having affairs, that, that he had gotten somebody pregnant that wasn't his wife, he would have been in trouble for that. He also had working against him the fact that his wife, she had found out in the past that he had done things like this um, and that she had given him an ultimatum that you, you know, if you do that again, we're not gonna stay together. This case was obviously so tragic because it involved such a young, beautiful, vivacious mother of a small child that was really just trying to make the best life that she could, that was trying to do something with herself. And then to have that taken away at such a young age for such a senseless reason. A trail of lies and deceit ends with the death of a young woman who only tried to make a better life for herself and her little boy. Instead, Samira Watkins' son is left without a mother and her tight-knit family 
has lost their beloved older sister. That's all we have for you here on this episode of Prime Crime. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jesse Weber, and as always, stay safe.